was undeniably compelled and led in prayer to open to this chapter today. So I'm confident the Lord has something to teach us out of this chapter. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 15. Verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead, through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if, by some means, now, at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. That I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Amen. Amen. Isn't that incredibly beautiful? Look at verse 13. Paul says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. He says, I was hindered thus far. Or I, I have been hindered so far. I've been hindered until now. The name of the sermon today is, When Hindered, Press On in Love. When Hindered, Press On in Love in love. Let's pray together. O oh, Father, you speak to us so clearly through your word, and you speak to us of the Son of your love, Jesus Christ. And Father, we may be few gathered here today, but we know that you do not despise the day of small things. And Lord, your word is powerful and so beautiful, and we want to learn from you today. So we beg you, Lord, to send down your Holy Spirit into the body of every believer here and fill these believers with your power, with your spirit, with your enlightening force, Lord. Wake us up to behold your glory today, please. Lord, wake us up and, and straighten our necks and turn our Turn our heads upward to behold Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, make us better Christians because of the reading and the hearing of your word today. 
I pray specifically, Lord, that we would come to see Jesus Christ more clearly today and we would worship him more and that you would cut us to the heart and teach us to live lives that are 100% devoted to you, Lord, until your kingdom comes. Please, Lord, we beg you and we groan from the depth of our heart to come and show up today and help us. Open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. I know that you are with us, and I trust you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Luther was a man God used to rediscover the truth of the gospel, a truth that I hope you all know and have been saved by. And this is what Luther said about the letter to the Romans. This is so convicting and beautiful. Just listen to this. This epistle, Luther says, is really the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel. And it is worthy not only that every Christian should know it, word for word, but occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. It can never be read or pondered too much. And the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Isn't that a beautiful recommendation of this book? And the more I read the book of Romans, the more I've found that it is just dripping with pastoral love. This little section we just read here, Paul loves us as a pastor of God. He just loves his people. And then the book ends in chapters 15 and 16 with him just pouring out love upon his people. And midway through the book in chapter 9, he even cries out and says, I am willing basically to lose my salvation for my brethren according to the flesh. I'm willing to pour out my life for them and be accursed for them. So at the heart of this book is just this sacrificial pastoral love. And it's just so moving to me the more I read the book of Romans. I just want to unfold it to you today. And again, the name of this sermon is When Hindered, Press On in Love. We have a really small group today, but that doesn't matter. All of us need to learn today to press on in love. And there must be some reason that, the God, that God has given us this message and this text with just these few of us here. Consider this. Look at verse 13, what Paul says there. He says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. That's the pivot word in this whole passage for me. He says, hindered until now. What does that mean? The Greek word there is literally cut. He got cut. Or it's the word docked. Um, you know when you have a Doberman pincher? What do you do to its tail? You dock it, right? You cut it. That's exactly the Greek word here. When something gets docked. Or when your boss says to you, I'm sorry, but I have to dock your pay. That means I have to cut it, right? So Paul has been cut. He's been hindered. He's been cut back. Hindered from doing what he wants to do. Can we just consider how much Paul had been cut, docked, hindered at this point in his ministry? I wrote some things down here. First of all, he has been at this point on three massive missionary journeys, right? You can imagine them like ever-expanding circles. The first one is through Asia Minor, right, which is now modern-day Turkey. He goes up through Turkey and back to Jerusalem. Second one, up through Turkey and, and round through Greece, back to Jerusalem. Third one, round through Greece, and now he's in Corinth, and he's writing to this church in Rome. 
heading back to Jerusalem, and then planning to go to Rome. So he's had three missionary journeys. What else? He's met false converts. He's had many ministry disagreements, even with those he loves in ministry. He's had years and pr of prayer, and he calls it anxiety for all the churches, concern, care for all the churches burdening him every day. He's even, it says in Acts 16 and verse 6, been hindered by the Holy Spirit himself. It says the Holy Spirit held him back, hindered him, told him not to go. And let's do some math here. He's been in ministry from about A.D. 33 to 57. This is around the year 57. So approximately, anybody do quick math? 24 years. Approximately 24 years. So imagine that. Has anybody in this room been in ministry for 24 years? No. So he's up against some hindrances and a, a, a life of trial that I think none of us have experienced. But what's the result? He says right here, I want to go further. I want to visit Rome. I want to press on. I want to see you. He even says, I long to see you. And what else? He says, I'm, and I'm going to write you this letter here, which just so happens to be the greatest letter ever written, which just so happens to be the Mount Everest of Scripture. And I would even argue it's the best piece of writing that's ever been produced in the history of mankind. So he's sending that out to Rome. And then to add to that in chapter 15, he says, and I'm not just coming to Rome. I'm just, I just want to pass by through you to go where? To Spain. I want to keep going. I want to keep going. He's relentless here. And so I wonder if Paul could give us a bit of a model today for how to press on when we are hindered. Our church is growing. Praise be to God. We have visitors. We have new people here, and it's amazing. But we've also had setbacks. We've also been docked a little bit, cut a little bit at times. And I'm sure we can all feel it. What are some of our setbacks? We've had demonic attacks. We've had at times people who reject us and reject Christ. Many of you may know that in the last two months, some of us in this church poured out our hearts and our souls and our time and our resources for a certain man. And that man rejected us and he rejected Christ. And it hurts. I was part of that. And it does hurt because I loved that man. And, uh, but what are we going to do? Is that going to cause us to close up our hearts and say, okay, next time I'm going to be more cautious. Next time I'm going to watch my wallet more. Next time I'm going to, I'm going to guard that door a little bit more. No, I think we, we got cut a little bit and we should just press on and we should open our hearts wide and we should get ready to love even more. Press on to Rome, press on to Spain. We've also had problems in our families, maybe. We've maybe had sicknesses. We maybe have difficulties in our relationships. And my question to you today is, are these reasons to retreat? Or are these reasons to press on? Seriously, please consider this with me today. Because our flesh wants to say, retreat. Stop. Stop. It's not safe. Don't, don't do more. But we need to learn from God's word to press in and to press on and to get even to get encouragement from these little dockings. So we're going to look today at verses 1 through 15. And here Paul gives us, I would say, seven principles, principles for how to press on in leadership, how to press on in ministry and how to press on in love. I know that Paul has principles here for every single one of us. He has principles for us in our marriages, principles for us as pastors. He has principles for us when we lead a Bible study. He has principles for us as mothers. 
So I would just beg you all to take these down. And you have a challenge today. You need to apply this word to your heart. After you hear the word of God preached, you are then more responsible to do something with the light that's given to you. So I want to challenge you today. Think right now. What setbacks have you felt in the last month? How have you been docked like the tail of a Doberman Pinscher? How have you been cut back? And how are you going to press on? At work? At home? At school? In your heart? I also want to say this. We're going to talk about general principles here, and we're not going to cover everything Paul has to say. I think each verse of the book of Romans deserves maybe 10 sermons. So we're just pulling some deep principles from this text today. And then I want to also say this. This is a good chance to examine your heart and find out if you actually are a Christian. Because as I give you these principles one of two things is going to happen. If you are not a Christian today, the Word of God is going to pass through you like water. It's just going to go out the other end. And it's not going to stick. And you're going to leave here unchanged. So consider that. As you hear the Word of God preached today, what effect does it have on you? Does it stick with you? And if you are a Christian today, then you can discern spiritual things. And as you hear these words preached, there's going to be a pull on your soul. And you're going to feel an accountability. And you're going to feel, I have to do something about this. I have to actually be a doer of the word. I have to put this into play in my life. So consider that again. Either the word of God today is going to warm your heart to serve him more, or it's going to pass through you like water and have no effect. And that will be a great indication of if you are a Christian or not. And the last thing I want to say before we dive into this text is this. I'm telling you today to press on because I have been led through this scripture to say this to our church. And I believe we need to hear today that we have to press on. But I'm not telling you this. I'm not telling you that we need to just work ourselves to the bone. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He's not talking about working yourself to the bone, just tirelessly doing and doing and doing. He's talking about the condition of our hearts and pressing on with, with warmed hearts, pressing on in actual love to God. So not just about doing more every day, but about doing it in God's strength. Seven ways to press on. Let's read the text. Seven ways to press on when hindered. First, be immersed in God. Verses 1 through 7. Be immersed in God. Paul says, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. The first thing I notice right there is that everything Paul says about himself has to do with his being acted upon by another. He's Paul enslaved by God, sent out as an apostle, called, set apart. He's acted on by another. He says very little about what he himself does. It's all about what God is doing to him. And then look what he does in verse 1. This is so beautiful and mysterious. He repurposes everything in his life for God. Do you all remember the, that, is it called the Christmas movie? Where they take uh, the leg of a mannequin and you chop the leg off, and then you put a lamp shade on the top of it, right? And you make 
a lamp out of the leg of a mannequin. Yeah? What's that called? Repurposing. Right? You take what was a mannequin and you make it into a lamp. That's called repurposing. Uh, that's what Paul is doing right here in this first verse. Check this out. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called. Paul's Hebrew name was Saul, which meant asked for or called. So here he's saying, in effect, Saul or Saul to be an apostle. He's taking his name and he's repurposing it. Saul to be an apostle. Then the next word, separated to the gospel of God. Paul's old title was a Pharisee. And what does Pharisee mean in Hebrew? Perushim. It means separated, set apart. So what is this saying? He is Phariseed to the gospel of God. Do you all see what he's doing there? He's taking his old titles and he's repurposing them like that lamp and turning them to gospel purposes. Have you done this, Christian, in your life? Do you, do you say, oh yeah, I'm a musician? Or have you come to the point of saying, I'm a gospel musician? My music is now for Jesus. Do you say, oh yeah, I'm a hockey player? Or do you say, I'm a gospel hockey player? Do you say, I'm a plumber? Or do you now say, I'm a plumber for Jesus Christ? You see, Paul is repurposing everything in his life for Christ. And then what does he do next? Next we find that his life is completely wrapped up in the Trinity. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, verse 2, which he, that's God, which God promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning who? His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And you see how he stacks up those names for Jesus Christ? He heaps them up. His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we find right there, what? That God has a Son. Tell the Muslims that God has a Son, and they'll tell you that you're going to hell. But our God has a Son, and he gives us this gospel, and it concerns his son. So who's that? God the Father is giving us a gospel, and it's about his son, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's speaking of Christ's full humanity. He was fully man, born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. He was fully God at the same time the Son of God, with power. And how was he declared to be that way? According to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Do you all see that? So we have God the Father giving us his gospel, and it concerns his Son, and all of that is declaring him to be the Son of God, with power, how? According to the Spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit is the one who's making that happen with power. Do you all see right here how that little name, Paul, has almost retreated into the background? And, and up from the depth has come this in, incredible mountain of the Trinity of our God. And our God takes over the whole landscape. And Paul retreats into the background. Look, he's left at the top of this. Just Paul, one little word. I ask you today... What are the proportions in your life? Does your life look like this? How much God is there and how much you is there? Would you say there's maybe 5% God and 95% you? Do you maybe have 90% of yourself, but on Sundays you come to church? So you try to get maybe 10% God in your life? Or do you have a 50-50 relationship with God? 50% you? 50% God? Paul here is 
is giving 100% God, 0% Paul. There's no Paul left. He has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer he who lives. He's nowhere to be found here. Do you all see that first principle? Be immersed in God. That's how we must press on as a church. We must be immersed in God. Are you today? Second, let's go to verse 8. Be thankful. Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. Isn't that amazing? It's so simple. He says, I thank my God for you all. Here I want to simply ask you, how thankful are you? How much do you thank your God for everyone sitting right next to you? And not only that, but how much do we express our thanks? And this is a vital message that's just going to the few of us saints who are gathered today. But how much do we really express our thanks for one another? Are you too embarrassed to tell someone else in this church that you're thankful for them? I, I think we can be certain from this text that we need this to press on. We need to actually open our mouths and say, Brother, I thank God for you. We need to be able to say that. Or do we all have a ministry of wanting to be like John MacArthur and Paul Washer? We all we want to be big boys. And is any of us willing to just start a ministry of thanksgiving? Where you just thank God every day for everyone who sits next to us. Where we thank our pastors, we thank our preachers for preaching. We thank one another. We thank God for each other. We get this popcorn of thanksgiving going on in our church. Do we have that? I'm not sure that we do. We desperately need that. We need to be thankful for one another. Or we're going to be lunch for the devil. Again, we need to thank God. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Third principle for pressing on. In verse 9, be on your knees. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Just notice a few things there about verse 9. For God is my witness. Witness to what? That without ceasing I make mention of you. That's really powerful. Think about what Paul is saying right there. He's saying effectively something like this. God can confirm what I do in my prayer closet. God sees. God is a witness of what I do when I'm alone. God is a witness that I pray for you all the time. Can you all say that? Can you say, the Lord can tell you what I've been doing and how much I've been praying for you. And then what does he say here? God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. The word there is unceasingly in the Greek or without letting up without interruption. Can we say that about our prayer lives? I'm praying without letting up, without interruption for you. I'm reminded of, of, of Samuel, who at the end of his ministry, he's giving over the ministry to Saul. And he's leaving. He's retiring, in effect. What does he say? 1 Samuel 12, verse 23. He says, Far be it from me, that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Samuel sees it as a sin against God if he would cease to pray for his brothers and sisters. That's a very serious sin. But Paul is saying here, 
God can witness that in my secret moments, I pray for you without ceasing. He also says, I make mention of you always. And when Paul says that, he actually means that he is speaking of people by name. He knows everybody by name. Here's something I want to exhort us all to do from this day forth. Get a prayer list. Do you have a prayer list? Just a name of everybody in this church, everybody in your family. Write it down. Print it out. Write it in your journal. And just pray through that. And that's a way that you can come to say with Paul right here, without ceasing, I make mention of you daily or weekly. It's been one of the most moving things for me when a brother has said to me, you know, Sam, I, I pray for you on Mondays. I'm like, what? It's, it's amazing. It's, it's such an honor that someone would actually pray for you without ceasing, weekly. Isn't that Christian love? That was principle three, be on your knees. Principle four, for how we will press on in love when hindered. Verse 10, I love this verse. Here's the principle. Be so eager that your language falls apart. Be so eager that your language falls apart. I once heard someone say of me in this church that he's too dramatic. I don't care. I seriously do not care. I mean, Spurgeon at one point said, I don't care if I fall flat on my face in front of my congregation as long as they know that Jesus Christ is worth being excited about. Isn't that amazing? Look what Paul does right here in verse 10. He says, I'm making a request if, comma, by some means, comma, now, comma, at last, comma, I may find a way, comma, in the will of God, comma, to come to you. <laughs> what it feels like in the Greek is that Paul is actually stuttering here. He's like, oh, I, I, well, I just, I just want to see you. He's, he's stuttering out of love for his brothers and sisters and how much he wants to see them. You all see that? Look at it again. If, by some means, now, at last, I may find a way in the will of God. He stutters in excitement. He trips over his words. And the lesson for us is that at the height of Christian love, it's okay if your language falls apart. Here's a, a principle I really want to hammer home in this church. In the last month or two, I've heard it said way too many times that people are comparing their ability to speak and their ability to think. I've heard it in this church, so I'm calling us out on this. Stop it. We should not be comparing how we all speak and how we all think. We should not be saying, I'm dumber than him, or he's dumber than me, or whatever. We shouldn't be comparing, oh, who's able to speak more? Something like this. That's a foolish waste of time. And it's, in effect, it's evil and it's prideful to be so obsessed with how we talk or how we think. Paul here just abandons language altogether and he just, he just stutters and he just trips over his words because he loves and he wants to get this gospel out to them. And you know that Paul does this a lot. Midway through this letter, Romans 11, verse 33, what does he do? After he's explained the gospel in such detail, such detail for 11 chapters, he just breaks out into, oh, the depth both of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. That's not even a sentence. There's no verb there. He just, he just says, oh. That man, Sam Storms, has a really nice sermon called The Word O." Oh, is a word in the Bible. It's a good sermon. You should all listen to it. The word O oh, is, a, is a word in the Bible. It's not a complete thought. He's not caring about that. He's just in exclamation and in awe at who God is. Look, as you read your New Testament, watch Paul do that. Watch his language break apart at certain 
important junctures. Second Corinthians 5 verse 17. You all know this verse. You don't have to flip there, but most of our translations say, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Second Corinthians 5 verse 17, right? Paul doesn't say that. He says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. There's no verb. He just lets the sentence fly. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. Isn't that amazing? Or the writer of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday? No, he says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It's not even a sentence. It's just like an exclamation of how amazing God is. So the principle here is be so eager that your language falls apart and stop in this church. Stop comparing how our minds work. Stop comparing our, our gifts of eloquence. That's foolish. We don't need that. Fifth principle, moving on. In verses 11 and 12. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. The principle here is be mutual. Be mutual. What do I mean? Paul says, I long to see you that I may give you some spiritual gift. But watch as this verse goes on. Verse 11. So that you may be established. And then he says, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Do you all see that? He wants to give them a spiritual gift. And then he quickly says, and I want to be encouraged by you through our mutual faith, our common faith. So my principle here is be mutual. What do I mean? We have some in this church who are just givers and some who are just takers. But we don't want that. We all as Christians want to be mutual. We want to be giving and receiving. And I'm sure some of you feel how hard that is. There was a man in my family who died about 10 years ago, and he was a, a giver. We can call him old man giver. And he would just give and give and give. If you went to visit him, he would teach you how to drive a truck. He would teach you how to drive um, a stick shift. He would teach you how to cut wood. He would teach you how to throw hay from his barn into the back of his truck and to throw it off the back of his truck into the field. He would teach you and he would give you cookies and he would give you dessert and he would be there for everyone all the time, constantly giving. He was the most giving man I've ever met. But when this old man giver died, they found his study and there were just bills unpaid. There were loans that had not been dealt with. There were notes about how he needed help on different things. And it was really, in a way, tragic and hurt his family. Why? Because he wasn't being mutual. He wasn't giving and receiving. He was only giving. And we can't have that in this church if we want to press on. We all need to give and receive. Do you see how Paul's doing that? I want to impart a gift to you, and I want to be encouraged by you, by the mutual faith that we have. That's so important. No one here can be a one-man show. No one here can be the only one giving, and no one here should be the only one selfishly taking either. Moving on, sixth principle, be clear. Be clear. Look at verse 13. Paul says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. Go home and meditate on those two verses. 
Look at how much Paul is being clear about right there. He's clear about his intentions. He's clear about his setbacks. He's clear about his plans. And he's clear about who he's going to teach. That's just a, a load of clarity, isn't it? I find that amazing. And I was thinking of this. We should be rebuked that uh, sometimes non-Christian sports coaches can be more clear than Christian pastors and leaders. We need to be as clear as Paul is. Isn't this an amazing principle right here? What does he say? Verse 13. Now I do not want you to be unaware. Just grab onto that phrase. That's how Paul speaks. Read through his letters and look how many times he speaks like this. And he says, you got to get this. I don't want you to be unaware of this. Understand this. Here are a few to write down and think about. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever stopped to ponder how many times Paul says that type of phrase? I don't want you to be unaware. I want you to know. you got to know. Philippians 1 verse 12 that we were studying in the men's study. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things that have happened to me have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul's saying, you got to get this. You have to know. Galatians 1 verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Are we going to proceed in this church with clarity? And I need this for myself because my thoughts can be so jumbled. My prayers can be so jumbled. And what, I, what I've tried to learn to do is just to say less. Paul keeps it really simple. He just says, I want you to get this. And then he says, this is this. And that's how he talks throughout many of his letters. Just study this. Study the clarity of Paul's preaching of the gospel. you got to get this. And he says, the head of every man is Christ. He just defines terms. Simple, clear sentences. Leading the people of God. Leading families. Leading our nation back to God just with simplicity, with clarity. And finally... We'll end with verse 15. Here's your final principle for how we can proceed in love when we are hindered. Be ready to give it all you've got. That's my last principle. Be ready to give it all you've got. What does Paul say in verse 15? So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. I want you all to call out your translation there. If you have the ESV, what does it say in verse 15? So as much as is in me, I am ready. What is, what's in the ESV? So I am eager to preach the gospel. So I am eager to preach the gospel. Okay. NASB? Same thing. I am eager. Yeah. It says, so for my part, I am eager. Yeah. yeah. So for my part, I am eager. And here, I think the New King James and King James is most accurate. It says something like this. As much as is in me, I am ready. And the NAS is getting to that sort of feeling. For my part, I'm ready. For my part, I'm eager. The Greek is literally like this. It sounds like a Mick Jagger lyric. The eagerness is down to me. The eagerness is down to me. What would that mean? The readiness is down to me. It's almost like it's up to me. I think the best way we could translate this in a, is, in our modern terms, is something like this. I'm going to give it all I've got. Simply that. I'm going to give it all I've got. So, as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. I'll just end with a, a quick biography of my dear friend who was put in the ground yesterday, last, um, 
yesterday afternoon. His name was Clifford Holder, and he died at age 94. And he was really my dear, dear mentor. He would always call me his son. And uh, this was up in Toronto at a place called Christie Street Baptist Church. Just listen as I tell you the sweet story of, of, of his life. Because he's a man who I think embodied all these principles that I've given you today. And especially this last one. He gave it all he had at all moments. Cliff was a man of meager means. If you talk to him about the Bible, he would talk about Psalm 23 and Psalm 91 and Philippians. It was, it was almost like there was no, nothing else in the Bible. <laughs> And then he would, he loved that, the daily bread, you know, those little things, those little books that you pass out. He was like a distributor of the daily bread to all of Toronto. That was just his calling. <clears throat> but he also had other good gospel tracts. He knew the gospel well, and he would pass those out. He had very little, you could say, but he would always give you everything. Everything. Every time you saw him, every time you were at church with him. There were other men in that church who were going to Toronto Baptist Seminary, and they had a lot more knowledge than Clifford Holder. But they would hold it back. They would keep it to themselves. But Cliff would just, he would do this, as much as is in me, I'm ready to give you all I've got. Here are some things I remember for him, from him. I prepared my first sermon at that church, and uh, right before that, he... Um, he sort of, he always yelled when he talked, but he would, he said, uh, have you prayed over every single word? Uh, that's probably the best advice I've ever heard about how to prepare a sermon. And then he said this, get an idea and then say, Father, do you want me to say this to your people? So he would ha he, he said, I had to go through every single word that's been prepared and say, Father, do you want me to say this to your people? I mean, that's better than, than 10 years in seminary right there. Pray over every single word, he said. And then Cliff would not tolerate being mean to yourself. And I've talked about that a bit in this sermon. But if you were ever mean to yourself and Cliff were around, he would say, Stop being evil. That's the way he would rebuke you. Just stop being evil. If you're down on yourself or if you're being self-deprecating. Cliff was very wise. He wouldn't just say that's some little sin or, you're, or something. He'd say stop being evil. Stop it. Enough. And then I have to tell you about how Cliff would listen to sermons. Because again, he would always give it all he's got. He was a great sermon listener. He would sit there and his hands would always be like this. And he wouldn't look at you, but he's looking up toward his heavenly father. And he would listen just with a great smile on his face. And sometimes he'd go like this. And then he'd go back. And sometimes he'd go like this. He would listen to a sermon the whole time like that. It was so honoring. And then afterward, he'd come meet you in the kitchen and he'd fold up his Bible and he'd smack you with it. And he'd say, you preach the word. You preach the word. You preach the word. <laughs> and he was so excited when anyone would just be faithful to this word. And then finally, I'll mention this. Cliff refused to ever use an ATM. Not because he didn't like technology, but he said, I will never use an ATM because there's some bank teller in there who needs one of my gospel tracts. So he would never, ever go to a machine. He wanted to see a real person inside, and he wanted to give them the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Add to that that Cliff also had throat cancer for 30 years. His first wife hunted him down on the streets of Detroit and tried to, um, uh, hunted him down with a pistol, tried to shoot him and kill him. In Paul's terms, he was docked. He was Cut. He got hindered many times in his life. But he lived out these principles that we've outlined today. 
to be immersed in God, to be thankful, to be on our knees, to be so eager that our language falls apart, to be mutual with each other. He was clear and he was ready to give it all. Matthew Henry says this, Observe the power of divine grace. That which was intended by the enemy to discourage was overruled for encouragement. Y'all get that? When we are hindered in this church, I want to exhort us today to press on in love. Let's just take heart, Christians, and let's press on. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity and the beauty of your word. Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts. And I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to preach to us as our day goes along and to bring these words to remembrance so that we may grow in your scriptures, Lord. Please make us a loving congregation and please make us a congregation that turns discouragement into encouragement. Mm. Father, we pray for the glory of Jesus Christ in our midst today. In his name, amen. amen. amen.